this is Robert Kiyosaki. I'm here with my best buddy here, Ken McElroy. And we're talking about our favorite subject, the subject of investment real estate. And this is a very important podcast, especially the world situation we're in right now. Uh, you know, at, at the end of this program, the reason it's important is because if you're going to invest in real estate, you'd better have some good mentors, good coaching, good guidance. So real estate requires very special, much higher levels of financial education, sophistication, and experience. A lot of my friends are real estate agents. Yeah, they just, well, the new ones, they just don't know. You, you know, they they think everything's going to go up. And, and in, in a lot of cases, it has, Robert. I mean, if, if, you, if you were in real estate eight or nine years ago, all you've seen was it go up. And, and so you probably think you're pretty smart about now. <laughs> I've well, seen what, what really happened, as you know, is that the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury, they just started printing more money than ever before in the history. So this is called the everything bubble. And from some of the more people I respect, they say this is the biggest bubble in world history. And it is in dollar amounts. And if history repeats itself, this is going to be the biggest crash in history. Now, for, so, some, for many people, it's going to be the worst thing ever happens to them. But for Kenny and me, it's the best time yeah. to buy more real estate after the crash. It requires uh, wisdom and study and experience. experience. And, uh, you know, you have to go through a couple yeah. crashes in order to learn a little bit. And at the same time, we're going to make a lot more money from real estate, aren't we? Yeah, because the crashes all have things that are similar each and every time. Yeah. So if you know what you're watching and you know what you're looking for, then... I think um, you, you can be on the right side of it and make a lot of money. So let me tell you how I met Kenny was that after I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I said some very, 25 years ago, I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad this year. And I said such stupid things as savers are losers. Man, I got attacked by every loser out there. New York Times came after me. How can you say savers are losers? Then I said, your house is not an asset. Oh, how can you say that? You know. I was living at the point on 16th street in Phoenix and I was on this TV show, a local TV show in Phoenix. And I said, your house is not an asset. And I walked in for breakfast after the TV show and I got mobbed by the, <laughs> these, these two women came after me. You don't know what you're talking about. My house is an asset. It's the biggest asset I have. I'm going, okay, okay, okay. No, nah, they're screaming at me. I'm going, okay, okay, okay. I won't say it anymore. And the third thing, is the rich don't work for money. So those are the three things. Savers are losers. Your house is not an asset and the rich don't work for money. Those are three very important points that came out in Rich Dad, Poor Dad 25 years ago. And today, Rich Dad, Poor Dad remains the number one personal finance book in history. But I had to go through hell listening to everybody else. And then I met Kenny one day because everybody was flipping back then. Yeah, everyone. And I, I said, so Kenny comes up to me and I said, well, Kenny, you're a flipper. He goes, no, I don't flip. I went, Kenny was the first guy I met that didn't flip property. <laughs> it's hard to find good property. And I like to cash flow. And I was, I was, uh, I was searching for cash flow, passive yeah. income. I, I, I wanted to work hard, but I wanted my property and my money to work hard too. Yeah. So I knew that if I sold something that I really, you know, had a tough time finding, I just have to do it again. Have we ever sold anything yet? Yeah, we've sold some things, some. but not very much. Not know, most, yeah, yeah. I would say in every case, we always we start out with the fact that we're going to hold. We hold long, hold, long, yeah, long, 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 long time. I mean, Kim and I have a plan that we're going to fold all of our properties, which we have a lot of properties and oil wells and businesses into what's called a CRT, a child remain to trust. And that'll be one of those big foundations that goes on for perpetuity, giving the money back to society. So we don't plan to just flip it and sell it. And that's what most stupid investors do because the moment you flip a property, you have tax problems, right? You have a lot. That's why well, when we've sold, we've done a 1031 tax deferred exchange and bought something bigger. Yeah. So you can sell 
and you can defer tax through a 1031 exchange. Oh. That's just one of the many things that oh. you can learn about real estate. You don't have to pay tax. You don't have to pay the capital gains on a transaction. Uh, you can use the equity and the momentum that you've gotten already from something and move it into the, to the next big deal. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a 10 Roberts free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Go to richdadfree.com. It's time to get smarter. So you're doing the smart thing by watching this program right now, especially if you've never invested in real estate before. The most important thing you can do is learn from people who have done it before. So we don't sell property, we sell education. So with, with that said, is, I mean, can I mean, it's been an interesting journey, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, it has been the best. We've made so much money. So there's always good things and bad things, but just realize that it's not, you don't just buy it and flip it or you buy it and hold because it's a very sophisticated product. Anything else you want to say about the mistakes that people make when they first get started? Well, there's so many. Uh, the first one is that they think that they need their own money. That's actually the biggest one that I hear of the mostly. And, and I, I get it. Like I was that way. I, I believed that I had to save and that I needed that money for a down payment. And that is the traditional way. But the reality is, is there's so much money looking for good deals. If you have the education to see those good deals and track record. Yes. And track record and team. You, you, if you can see those deals, the money flows in as, as we like to say, you know, the bigger, the brochure, the worse, the deal. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ken and I came across that during the real estate boom, we were speaking with Donald Trump on stage Yeah. on before he was running for president, he was running for real estate guy. <clears throat> and these, we go to these big conferences, all these real estate conferences, and they had this most elaborate brochure trying to sell you a bunch of crap. Yeah. And so that set up a rule for us. Yeah. Well, we remember we were walking through the booths and, you know, when we travel around pre 2008, it's fun to do, you know, walk around and see what people are, you know, there are people buying all over the world and people converting member cruise ships into condos and all this stuff going on all the time. There's always some crazy ideas out there. Some of them are really, really good. And uh, so we gathered all these brochures and we went back into the green room and we we're uh, just looking at them. And I was like, man, the big ones over here, those are the toughest ones. Those are the, those are the, those are the hardest deals to make sense of financially. And of course they were because they, you know, they were two, three, four, five dollars per brochure. Yep. And then we have our friend, John McGregor, who handles our paper assets. So yeah. He says the same thing. He says, the more you see these ads on television, like John, I, we, Ken and I don't really know stocks, so I shouldn't say anything, but John McGregor just goes nuts when he sees Fisher investments. He says, yeah, how can anybody be that stupid and believe them? But people do, you know, without any financial education, I'm not saying Fisher is good or bad, but John hates them. He says they're lying to the people. And I'm going, I don't know, but Kenny and I say the same thing when we're going through these real estate shows, these massive brochures, like they cost, like it says five to $10 each. Yep. And the bigger the brochure or the more the advertising they did, the worse. If you deal. think about it, it's true. Like, I mean, most deals, most good deals that we do are kind of like, like tonight we're going to dinner after, after this and, you know, we'll sketch something out on a napkin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, the, the paper napkin is notorious for putting good deals together. I mean, how many, how many brochures have you sent me? None. <laughs> I mean, it starts with the napkin and then the brochure for, for us, our business plans are based around uh, the deal already being done. So it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, a plan, a one, two, three, four, five year plan than a pitch for equity. The equity most of the time comes in and the business plan formulates it. You got to have a business plan for the lender, but most sophisticated investors get you know, get the, you know, get the deals. And, and, and what Kenny is always looking for is the train wreck that some amateur investor, yeah. you know, I call him the skipper of the Titanic. You know, yeah. I listen to some of these guys, you know, I got into a big fight with Grant Cardone and 
because he was saying, if you're a real estate investor, start with $20 million in a 200 unit apartment house. I'm going, you don't start there. He says, yeah, you're not a real man if you don't start there. I'm going, but we've seen guys do that. They go and buy a $20 million property. It crashes or they can't manage it and people vacate it. Remember that one that was at San Antonio? Or yeah, remember, we still own that. Yeah, and it was the worst property I've ever seen. I walk into the first unit, there's a toilet sitting in front of the fireplace. And yeah. Kenny's going, what a great deal. And yeah. A toilet in front of the fireplace. Well, it was owned by the lender. So a, yeah. one of the big banks owned this property. They had gotten it back. It was 40% vacant, which means it did not cash. And flow. accelerating down. Yes. And it, and it was full of also full of some some bad people. So but located right incredibly right in front of USAA, which right. is one of the biggest employers in San Antonio and, and hospitals too. I yeah. That. Yeah. And so it was all around healthcare and, and, and the insurance industry. And, and uh, I knew it was a tough one, but it, it would take a couple of years to turn around. And I think we did it in a year and a half. And, you know, we had, uh, you know, you got to rent 400 units, <laughs> you know, in the first couple of years to so, do it. So Kenny, up. Kenny walked me through it. I'm in, I'm white knuckly. I go, this is the most, this is the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. But the guy that sold it to me yeah. was your builder. What yeah. was his name? Yeah. His name was also Ken. Ken. Yeah. This guy looked at it. He goes, yeah. Yeah. I'm well, looking at this thing that's going to fall down. He's going. This yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. I and mean, that's what we do though, Robert. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, you have to have the team for that. You have to go find those. If you, if you think about it, you don't really make a lot of money on, on buying something and hoping the market goes up. You make money Take on seeing something that nobody else sees or taking over somebody else's problem. You're solving somebody's problem. Well, also what Kenny said, the reason was a good deal was not the property was as Kenny always says, Real estate depends on jobs. Yes. And there were solid, solid, solid jobs, hospitals and insurance companies right next to this property. Yep. So Kenny could see things the average guy cannot see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, real estate exists for people, not the other way around. So if there's no people, uh, you're not going to do very well. So let me say the, so the thing I'm concerned about today, prior to 2020, 40% of all Americans had less than $1,000 in savings. And the moment the price of oil went up, food goes up. And today what's happening, so the retail market is collapsing because the American consumer doesn't have any money because they're paying more for gasoline and they're paying more for food. So how is that a good deal? Well, they have to rent. Isn't that true? That's right. Yeah, we're, we, I, I did a video recently on my YouTube channel I called it renter nation yep. and, and, you know, there are different presidents, uh, in history really everywhere, uh, have different policies on housing. And so back in the early two thousands, Bush's was everyone should own a home. Well, that created the, <laughs> the crash well, that we had and, yeah. and, and, uh, we've never really recovered and we're now we have, now we have an affordability issue. That's going to keep people out of single family is going to push them right into rentals. Well, the millennial generation and their kids, that doesn't look like they'll be able to buy. No. And the problem is BlackRock and those guys, those big private equity guys, hedge funds came in, they bought all the single families up because they realized what well, Kenny and I realized that's really renting property is better than owning property. You know, that's right. Yeah. And, property. and they're moving money into hard assets, right? You know, to try to get, you know, inflation's big. So it's, it's, it's the uh, highest it's been in, in years. And so if, if you're, if you're a company like that and you're sitting a lot of cash and they are, you want to move it into hard assets and real estate is a hard asset. So remember what I said, savers are losers. And the reason savers are losers, this is back 25 years ago and rich dad, poor dad is what caused the bubble is because especially after the 2020 election and COVID they printed $10 trillion. I know. But then again, they can't afford their houses. They can't afford to, they can only afford to rent. So that's why I said savers are losers. Your house is not an asset because I think they're going to push the interest rates up. And a lot of people who just bought property recently, hoping the price will go up. What happens if they raise interest rates on your house? What happens to the value? 
So traditionally, when when rates go up, a value of real estate goes down. Yeah, that's that's the way it's supposed to work. You know, hopefully, people that have been studying your your stuff, my stuff, they're they're in fixed rate debt, they're in hard assets, they're in cash flowing real estate, and they're on the right side of this because. The truth is there are going to be people on both sides. Right. And the other thing I said, well, number one was that savers were losers. Why would you save money when the government's dropping interest rates and printing trillions of dollars? It doesn't make any sense when, when you're getting paid 1% in the bank, but you're losing to inflation. It just, the math does not make sense. It doesn't work. But for some reason, people are choosing not to pay attention to those kinds of things. Because they're losers. Because they listen to stupid people like my poor dad. You know what I mean? People who have no idea on money. When, when I said savers are losers 25 years ago, I got attacked. I said, your house is not an asset. I got attacked. And I said, the rich don't work for money. Then every communist said, oh, all you, got, all you, all you, guys, all you guys don't think about is money. Well, Kenny and I don't use money. We use debt, right? You know, the reason yeah. savers are losers is because debt is a better way of buying, right? And we're just playing a big game. Yeah. Just like Monopoly, just like we did when we were kids. It's the same formula. So how deeply in debt are we? I have no idea, but I want to say that it's probably seven or 800 million. I think it's over a billion. Now. I don't, yeah, it could be. You see, the thing is, is that if you go, well, all coins have three sides, heads, tails, and the edge. So most people are on the side that say, oh, you should save money. But Kenny and I are the opposite of the side. We should use debt. And intelligence is standing on the edge of the coin saying, well, which side is right? You know, should I be saving money today? Let's see. Biden printed 10 trillion. You know, the price of oil is going up. Why would I save money? No, 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 no. You should save money. And on the other side of the coin, Kenny and I are borrowing money. So that's why my, my friend, Dave Ramsey, he says, live debt free. As a, you know, Dave's a friend of mine, but I, I, I tell him straight to his face. That's the worst advice you could give anybody today. Yeah, it's not good advice. It, it you, you know, just follow the math. Like that's it. And, and, and study history because it's happened before it'll happen again. And, you know, during these inflationary times, you're right, Robert, people are moving backwards. They're, they, they're looking at their dollars in the bank and they think that they're safe, but they're eroding from inflation. We had a guy on this morning. I did a live this morning and the, he, he lives in uh, Buenos Aires, Ar Argentina. And uh, he said that they're, 50 to 80 percent inflation he said that when they get their paychecks they convert them into u.s dollars i said man that's that's rough if you're doing that you're you're actually converting them you're just trying to hedge inflation from your own inflation but um you know, you know it's it's tough you need to be in hard assets if you're going to survive this And the key is hard assets. I don't own oil stocks. I own oil wells. There's a very big difference. So every time that, that thing goes up and down like this and pumps out a gallon of a barrel of oil, I get paid. 
But other people, oh, I got Exxon stock, I got Chevron stock. And the problem with that was interest rates go up, the stock market is going to come down. When the stock market comes down, gold, silver comes with it, and everything comes with it. But those with hard assets like cash flowing real estate and oil and stuff like that, money just keeps coming in. To me, that made sense. So that was my rich dad's side. And my poor dad's side was you should get a job, buy a house because it's an asset to get your PhD and put your money in the stock market. I just don't do that because my rich dad taught me differently. My rich dad was on the other side of the three-sided coin, heads, tails, and the edge. And what Kenny and I are saying today is stand on the edge of the coin and look at both sides. I mean, is that correct? You have to look at both sides yeah. because this too will change. Yeah. And something will happen again. And you all, you just have to evaluate it and see which direction it's going. Right now, we're just investing in things that people want and hold value. So things like timber, water, land, food, gold, silver, real estate. Those are things that are going to hold their value. Remember, in 2020, 40% of the U.S. population didn't have $1,000. But also, it forced more people to become renters. And that's driving up the price of rent because the cost of building a new apartment house is through the roof, right? New construction is horrible. As a result of that, we're severely short on supply. So the demand has, has hit. The supply has not kept up. So for the last 20 years, we're a little little over 5 million housing short. units short, 5 million. And it's just, you, you can't make that up. Now, it's that's for the USA, but every market is a little bit different. But but there, if you just Google it, just say how many housing units are, are we short? And it's it's been averaging somewhere between two and 300,000 a year for 20 years short. So it's in bad shape right now. And the demand is there. And now, to, now with this supply chain issue and the cost of goods going up, you can't really build housing affordably. So... There's now a massive gap between what's affordable and, um, and uh, you know, you can't build housing that's too expensive. And so it's going to, it's going to really be a problem. For and a this is a global problem. Yes. So the point here is the reason Kenny and I got together, I asked him to write three books for us. Yep. And what were the three basic, because you have those three basic books. If you're going to go into real estate, it's not like having a 401k. And speaking of 401ks, when the stock market crashes, my generation, the boomer generation, we're toast because the boomer generation was the first generation with a 401k. It happened in 1974 when the Fed and the Treasury and the government passed the thing called the ERISA Act, Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And I tell the government says income security, you know, you're screwed. <laughs> but that was a 401k. So when the stock market crashes, just as my generation starts to retire, they're toast. That's right. And they're going to start selling their houses because that's all they got, right? Yeah. Well, that's where they're really where their wealth is going to be. So back in 1973, when I came back from Vietnam, my, my poor dad, the poor guy, you know, Robert, I want you to go back to school, get your master's degree. I said, I hated school. Why would I go back and get my master's degree? And then he says, and then you get your PhD. I said to my poor dad, who was the head of education for the state of Hawaii, head of the teachers unions, you know, it's one of the reasons I started investing with Kenny is I make so much money. I've got to call Kenny. I said, Kenny, I need about 4 million in debt. Why do I need, why do I want debt for taxes? Well, first of all, tax is the biggest expense in your entire life. Right. There's no question about that. Nobody can dispute that. So the IRS actually in their tax code, they have a series of pages that tell you what they want you to invest in. Yeah. And one of those is housing. Real Other estate. one's oil and gas. Yeah. And, you know, there's all kinds of, there's wind, there's solar, those, those get tax breaks. Yeah. So you just followed what they told you to do. And in my case, uh, that um, I was the recipient of that. One of them was real estate. And so we use debt and you guys use debt. A lot, most people use debt when they buy a home and you or know, a car or a car, let's say, yeah, you don't usually pay all cash. There are plenty of countries that still you have to actually have the whole amount. But in the U.S., the, there's debt. And what that really is, 
it's OPM or other people's money. That money is from the bank, but guess where the bank gets the money? <laughs> from the savers. So the savers give the money to the bank, the bank gives the money to us, and we buy real estate with it. And they pay you 1%, they charge me five, and then I make sure my renter can cover it all. So that's the system, that's how it works. So let me tell you how the tax works is I make so much money. <laughs> The purpose of an entrepreneur is to start a business to buy real estate. People say, I'm going to save the world. So, no, no, you start a business so you can buy real estate. So I, let's say I make a million dollars in my business. I've got to call Kenny up and I say, Kenny, I need 5 million in debt. Right. Why do I need 5 million in debt is because when I take his 5 million in debt from a property he buys, my property goes to 6 million. Right. And then I depreciate the property at 6 million. Correct. You get, so real yeah. estate is the best, the ver I think the best of all tax dodgers there is. I haven't seen anything better no. yet. I'm still looking, but it is. The government, again, needs housing. They need the, oh, more than ever. They've done a horrible job trying to do it themselves. Yeah. So they push it down to the private sector and give, give us all kinds of tax benefits and all kinds of things. So when we produce housing, that's good for them. And they reward us with tax breaks. And when we, when we create jobs, and how many employees do you have? About 300. Yeah. And I, I make sure everything I invest in has jobs in it. Yes. So because I'm investing in Kennedy, Kennedy's got a lot of jobs. My oil company has a lot of jobs. Real estate company, I mean, my business companies have a lot of jobs. I get tax breaks. So everything they tell you to do in school, that's what I was talking about my poor dad. He said, I got to school. Yeah. Get a job save money, get your PhD and go broke. I'm going, are you freaking nuts? Having an open mind with what <laughs> is happening at the moment. So, you know, things changed, you know, the pandemic. So you start to layer up these things and you just watch what happens as a result of those things. And then you take action based on those things. So, so when, I don't know, you know, before Biden, we never, I never even heard of a trillion dollar bailouts. You know, we were always in the bees. So, but then all like, all of a sudden you're like, wow, okay. You put and that savers much, became losers. Yes. You put that much money into an economy. What's going to happen. And that's what we were studying. Okay. What happens when you dump that much money onto an economy? And a lot of those things have come true. But one of the things that we did is we got into fixed rate debt. So I fixed all of my debt thinking that you can't dump that much money into an economy without pretty high inflation. And it took, you know, I, I wasn't sure I was right, but we did that anyway, based on what was happening. And, you know, who cares if I fix my debt? You know, Cause I had floating debt too. So, so I fixed the debt. Now I look like, you know, a genius. A genius. So the reason I invest with Kenny was like, he's really the best at managing debt. And if you're going to do what we talk about, use debt as money, you better be as good as Kenny. So that's why I was very happy when he wrote his three basic books. He has more books than that. But the ABCs of real estate investing and the advanced guide, which is how to use debt as money. Yep. And number three is property management because you have to have property management. So those are three books. And if you're going to be a real estate investor, don't definitely don't buy buy from somebody who has their picture on a real estate card. Another thing too is my first real estate class was 1973. And because my rich dad said, if you're going to be a rich, you have to understand real estate. The purpose of being an entrepreneur is to buy real estate, not to buy a house, but to buy real estate. So it was long before I met Ken. So I'm, I'm still in the Marine Corps. I just came back from Vietnam. And I took my first real estate course and the instructor gave me the best advice all because he's a real real estate investor. He says, I want you to look at a hundred properties and write a hundred reports nice. on why the thing is yeah. good or bad. I was saying, why did I do that? But th that's the discipline. You have to look at least a hundred properties, write a report, what's good, what's bad about it. And that's how I learned. And then all of a sudden I started to see things the average guy could not see because they're trying to buy a house. It's got a nice bedroom, it's got a kitchen. I'm not looking at the kitchen or the bedroom. I'm looking at the, the value number. of the yeah. property. So after a hundred properties, I went, oh my God. So there was this one property on the island of Maui. And most people say, well, Maui is expensive. And it is. But the property on the island of Maui was a bad investor, dropped the whole property. 
and I bought my first rental unit. I already had a house, I mean, an apartment, a condo in Waikiki. But um, so I'm, I buy this condo in Maui. It was $18,000, nothing down. So I had 18,000 in debt. Yeah, on day one. And I made $25 from debt. It changed my life. Yeah. And so today, because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm making more and more money. It's now in the millions, not 25. I have to give Kenny the money because he knows how to take debt and turn it into income. And the more he does that, the less tax I play, pay. So that's why Kenny's books are essential if you're going to do this. Rich Dad's World will talk to you about how there's additional programs you can learn what we're talking about today because you're going to use debt and pay no taxes. You really better know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Oh, you have to. Yeah. It's a lot of people are getting into real estate because they feel like the commissions, you know, as, as you like to say, they're, they're working for tips, you know, a real estate commission, uh, but the, the, or they're flipping, they're buying something and then selling it, moving to the next thing. There's a tremendous amount of tax associated with that. There's a tremendous amount of work associated with that. Nothing wrong with making money that way. But if you really want to invest for the long term and get out of the rat race and not have money be a claim on your life or your time, then you have to think of strategy a little bit different. And that's invest more for the long term and try to get some of this passive income as opposed to active income, which is your W-2 or commission or you showing a house. Passive income is, you know, I have 10,000 renters. They're I'm sure they're paying today while we're on this show, uh, while I'm sleeping, you know, it's called mailbox money. And that's what we're trying to teach. When oil went from $30 to a hundred cash was pouring into my account. Yep. And the thing about oil, because the government wants people to drill for oil, I don't pay tax. That's right. And that's what's called financial education. And when I wrote rich dad, poor dad, 25 years ago, I said, what does school teach you about money? The answer is nothing because they want you to be stupid and work hard and pay a lot of taxes. It doesn't make any sense to me because real estate is, in my opinion, the best of all investments. I mean, if everybody can do real estate, not everybody can drill for oil. Right, right. But you can do real estate. So Kenny has three books, the ABCs of real estate, the advanced guide and, and property management, but you still best have a coach because my rich dad was my coach. And that's what rich dad's world is, is guide you through the process because real estate is, you don't just take a real estate course, do you? I mean, no, 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 no. It, it, it all boils down to the math and you don't need the money. And if, why wouldn't you buy something that your tenant pays off for you <laughs> and you get cash flow and you get tax breaks and you build up a passive income to the mountain, to, to, to the point where you don't have to work anymore. I mean, that's what everybody wants. Yeah, part of financial education is those three types of income ordinary income. Ordinary income is when you go and get a job. So that's about 40%. So you make a million dollars, you pay about 400,000 in taxes. But a doctor, because they're self-employed, will pay about 60% in taxes. So a doctor, if they make a million dollars, they're paying 600,000 in taxes. So that's ordinary income. And then there's passive income and passive income was what we work for. That's right. That's all I work for actually. Yeah, passive. And then there's portfolio income. And the reason portfolio income is important to know is that was, that's what flippers work for. Yeah. So okay. if I, let's say I buy a property for a hundred thousand and it goes to a million and I sell it for a million, that's called capital gains, right? Yep. That's what people are doing right now. So flippers pay the second highest taxes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's actually good for the government. It's good for them. They, you know, they get some walking around money. But again, you, you know, they're, they have to do it again. That's the problem. <laughs> it's a, you find it, a good property. You yeah, want to hang on to it. Right? Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the reward for doing a good job, bigger job, a bigger Walmart. job. Yeah. So, so, and, uh, you, you know, it's so I did that in my, in my youth, 
And, and the next thing I knew, I was like, man, I just worked my butt off for 10 years. And I don't have hardly anything to show for other than a bigger house, nicer cars, and a little bit of cash in the bank. Yep. I was like, there has to be a better way. So after 20, you know, when I met Kenny about 25 years ago, he, he doesn't flip property. I was like, oh my God, there's uh, one more sane person in the yeah. world. Because I made that mistake too. I, I didn't flip a property. This guy offered, I didn't, I didn't do it intentionally but they offered me so much money for a property. Then I had tax problems. I know it happened to me too. And then I couldn't find another property. <laughs> Imagine if you still own that condo and oh, $18,000. What do you think that on thing's the beach? worth now? <laughs> Millions. And then we don't have to sell it to be, take the, we can borrow the money out. Yeah. Then. Yeah. The bank will give you debt on it. That's called a cash out refi, which is tax free. And that's okay. what Kenny teaches. Yeah. It's called the advanced guide. That's right. It's how you use debt to get richer. That's right. But don't do it unless you study and have a good coach because you can do it again and again and again and again. And, and actually it's a system. So just think about this as Ken and I are sitting here, we have tens of thousands of renters sending us checks every month, yep. most of it tax-free. And plus with all my oil wells, money keeps pouring into my account tax-free also. And what my poor dad said to me was just go to school, get a job, get your master's, get your PhD, become a good hardworking man and pay your taxes. And then you wonder why you wonder why today the gap is in trouble. You know, the gaps clothing store because they can't afford to go shopping. They don't have discretionary income. Now the good news is a lot of commercial properties probably will come online, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have a gap in their income apparently. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it, you just got to pay attention to where things are heading and then be on the right side of it. But yes, retail is definitely in trouble. Commercial office is definitely in trouble. Malls are definitely in trouble. Renters are in trouble. Renters are in trouble. Because the cost of construction is going through the roof. Yeah. If you own multifamily, you're going to be, or any kind of rental, you're going to be just fine in the, you know, at least in the near term. So, you know, there's a lot of industrial is doing very, very, very well. So what they call last mile industrial, which is, you know, like think of Amazon when you, you, everybody wants, you know, something like in an hour now. So that has to store somewhere. So, so warehousing is doing warehousing's well. doing really well. Yeah. Really yeah. well. So, and so that's why in 1973, I was, I was a Marine pilot in Vietnam and I came home and my poor dad again says, go to school, get a job, get your PhD, get your master's and all this and you know, fly for the airlines as a uh, employee. And my rich dad, the first thing he said to me, is says, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, two things, you have to learn how to sell. So I got a job with Xerox, not because I want Xerox machines, I have to learn how to sell. And second, I have to take real estate. And he says, if you don't understand real estate, you'll always be poor yeah. because the purpose of a business is to buy the real estate. And I've never forgot those lessons. And that's why the rich keep getting richer, but the poor middle class keep sending their kids to school. They learn nothing about money. And then the people say, well, live tax debt free. I'm going, are you kidding me? If we all went debt free, the economy would collapse. I know. Yeah, what happens right. if I stop drilling for oil? The economy would collapse and get even worse. What happens if we stop building housing? There'd be more homelessness. And that's what the government gives us is tax breaks. Yep. I mean, it's just not, you don't just go out and buy a piece of property. I highly recommend studying and learning why and what makes a property good or bad. And that's all Kenny and I are doing right now. Rich Dad World is about freedom. Yep. It's about freedom, but it takes education. So anyway, thank you all for listening to this program. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate you all. Yeah, thank you. There's nothing more important today than your education. So thank you for listening to Kenny's podcast here and uh, Rich Dad's World.